Hi everyone, I'm Zoe and I use they, she pronouns. And I'm Jenny and I use they, she pronouns. We both work at CrowdStrike where I'm the accessibility lead. And I'm a UI engineer. CrowdStrike is a remote first cybersecurity company. So no matter where you're based, we're always hiring. We use Ember, Tailwind and TypeScript. If you're interested, DM us on Twitter and we'll connect you to the right people. Uh, today, we'll talk about the accessibility of the Space Jam websites. The real question is, which one? Because as it turns out, there are four. There's the original one from 1996. There's a new one for the 2021 film. There's a UK specific one with like cinema times. And they also have like a replica of the 1996 one, but for the new film. Uh, today, we'll look at the original one and the one uh, created for the new film. We'll use our finest tools to check their accessibility. And here we have Bugs Bunny pointing at our tools. Um, we'll use a keyboard to check for basic navigation. We'll use Apple's voiceover screen reader to look at the souvenir store and the Sharky Jaws screen reader to play some shark testing games on Windows. Last but not least, we'll dive into the code with Chrome's DevTools. Before all of this seriousness, we'd love to tell you why we chose the Space Jam website to begin with. We chose it for three reasons. Number one, it's awesome. It's the perfect companion to the cinematic masterpiece that is the Space Jam movie, a movie about Michael Jordan and a Bugs Bunny teaming up uh, to play basketball against the aliens. Number two, it's a time capsule. The website has not changed since it was created in 1996. And before we reveal reason number three, let's look at the Ragtag team that created the original. Uh, the team behind the website is Andrew Stackler, Jim Brown, Michael Tritter, Darlin Ways, and uh, the team was led by Don Buckley with very little studio oversight. The team was largely composed of designers who taught themselves HTML. They used the latest web techniques available to them at the time to create a website that to this day stands the test of time, which leads us to reason number three, the new Space Gym website. Like the old one, it was created as a marketing website to promote um, Space Jam A New Legacy, a 2021 movie featuring LeBron James. And uh, this is where the similarities really seem to end. The new website had two decades worth of front-end development, knowledge, and expertise. And whereas accessibility was not a term widely used in the 90s, Warner Bros, like any large corporation, keeps on claiming that accessibility really, really matters to them. But does corporations promising to be accessible actually translate into accessible website? Or is it self-indulgent promises like Doug Duffy kissing a Warner Bros logo on his butt in this GIF? And have two decades worth of experience and tooling actually made the web more accessible? And is the new Space Jam web movie better than the old one? We will focus on these three questions in our demos, and we will use different tools on each of the two websites to assess how accessible they are. The first, in the first demo, we'll be checking how easy the websites are to navigate using keyboard only. I will first look at the old Space Jam website, then at the new one. In both cases, I'll start on the landing page, then navigate away to any other page. Look at that and then come back to the landing page. Uh, now let's go through the keys that I will be using. I'll use tab to focus on various elements. Shift plus tab to go to previous focus. Enter to click on links. Control plus tab to go to the next browser tab. And let's begin the demo. So we are on the old Space Jam website. Uh, in the middle, we have Space Jam logo around it, in circling around it um, are planets. Uh, each planet has a writing somewhere near it, like Press Box Shuttle or Jam Central. Essentially, the landing page is the main navigational menu. So let's press tab to see where we are. Okay, and we see the focus appear on the press box shuttle. Well, let's see how we can navigate this menu. I'm pressing tab and again. Okay, right, so here you can nitpick that it's 
be the navigation became a bit weird because it started off going clockwise and now it's skipping it skipped from right to left and then from left to right but apart from that no, there are no red flags really so everything works we see the focus i'm on the last link now behind the jam i'm going to press enter and we're taken to behind the jam page so in the top uh, left corner i have the space jam logo i assume it will take me back to the landing page in the center um there's an image that says behind the jam in the image there are four phrases uh let's see if it's just an image or can i tap into it well yeah what happens if i tap so i press tap tap again okay cool so i'm actually on the phrase on animation sketches in the image and if i tap again i move to character development well let's see if it's just fo the focus moving or if i press enter something will happen so i'm pressing enter and yeah it took me to the character development page i mean by now we've overdone what we set out to do we've seen two random pages rather than just one uh so let's try to get back to the landing page so i'm pressing tab the focus is on the space jam logo i'm pressing enter i'm back to the uh landing page well that went really well for a 25 year old website um so I'm going to press control tab and I am on Space Jam, a new legacy. And straight away, there's an issue. I'm not actually seeing the landing page. What I'm seeing is a YouTube popover, which is covering the landing page. So before we even get to begin the demo, I have to close the YouTube popover. This should not be a big problem because uh, I can see in the top uh, right corner, there's a yellow square with a cross. I assume that's the close button. So it's just a matter of tabbing to it, closing it and beginning the demo. So I press tab and I don't see focus. Okay, so, okay, the focus is on the popover and pressing tab again. Okay, so it looks like it's about to go off. Well, maybe I somehow missed it. So let's try tapping back. So shift tab, I'm tapping back. Yeah, I, okay, so yeah, I'm not seeing the focus anywhere. I. Okay, so I'm now back on the Space Jam. So I'm now back on the Space Jam legacy website. The focus is somewhere there. And I know that, oops, sorry. Let's shift up again. So I know that the focus is somewhere on the website now uh, because the Space Jam legacy, I can see Space Jam legacy synopsis URL in the bottom left corner. Um, because clearly tabbing through the popover did not allow us to get to the button. Uh, let's try and improvise. Maybe if I just press enter here, I will get to the synopsis page without the use of the button. So, um, I'm going to press enter. Okay. And the page actually changed. I know it did because in the URL we have synopsis, um, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not seeing the page, I'm seeing the popover. Um, and as we've seen, I cannot get to the button. So essentially, I can call it a day here. Thank you everyone for coming to our talk. Um, see you in a year. Um, it's, um, we have a 25 year old website that works absolutely fine. And this modern creation that has a button that will not close and that does not close and does not even allow us to get to the landing page and as much as i like to joke that a web developer's job is about centering divs and creating buttons we do get paid to create buttons that work 
that is why there's always an outcry when articles are published about buttons that cost companies millions because they don't work on all devices or for all users. And here we have an example for such a button. It works for some users, but not others. Money aside, Zoe and I work for a cybersecurity company. A working button could mean the difference between stopping a breach or not. And on this somber note, I will pass over back to Zoe. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the demos. Um, right, so let's see what's going on with this yellow square with a cross on it that's pretending to be a button, because clearly it isn't a button to everyone. Uh, we can use Chrome's DevTools, or any DevTools for that matter, uh, to inspect the element. Uh, we can do so by right-clicking on it and choosing Inspect. We get the DevTools, and on the left-hand side, we see um, a panel with all of the HTML. And we see that this supposed button uh, is, in fact, a div with an ID of trailer close. There's a data attribute and a style attribute with some styling. Nothing, uh, nothing super interesting. Inside of it, we'll find two spans. Uh, these are used to like create the cross itself. Um, but maybe we want to learn a bit more about the accessibility of this uh, at, of this element. So we can use the accessibility tab in Chrome for that. Um, on the right hand side, you might have the tabs styles, computer layout, and event listeners, and there will be a Chevron menu with more options. If we open that menu, we can find the accessibility tab. Inside of the accessibility tab, uh, we find a few sections. At the top, we have the accessibility tree, which is essentially all of the accessibility information for the entire page or for all of the components on the page aggregated. Uh, you could navigate this if you had wanted to, much like a DOM. And um, under that, we find the ARIA attributes applied to the current element. There are none at this moment. And under that, we find perhaps the most interesting section uh, for this demo anyhow. Uh, the computer properties, which um, involves things like the name, which currently is empty, so this element has no name, uh, and the role, which is gener generic, which is the implicit um, type or the implicit role for, uh, for divs. So this isn't a button by any means other than it vaguely looking like a button, but maybe we can change that. So what do we do if we have an accessibility issue like in our HTML? we add more ARIA. So let's do that. Let's add an attribute and we'll go role is button because that's what I want it to be. Um, so if we look in the accessibility tab, we can now see under ARIA attributes that, hey, there's a role uh, and it is button. And under computer, we can see that it, uh, the role is now indeed button, but it still doesn't have a name. So of course we can fix that with more ARIA, right? So let's do ARIA label. And we'll use close dialog. I think that's that's like clear enough. And again, if we look in the right hand panel, we can see that aria label is added as an attribute, and it's also now used to uh, compute the name. Yeah. So the interesting thing about computer properties is that you can also see where it comes from, uh, which is very helpful. Um, one thing though is that divs by default aren't in the tab order, so you wouldn't be able to get to this what is now semantically a button uh, with your keyboard. So in order to fix that, we can use the tab index attribute and we can set it to zero, uh, which tells the browser that I want to add this element to the tab order based on where it is in the DOM, which is the default behavior for all HTML elements. Okay, so I think we should be in a pretty good place to now like try this demo again. So let's do that. Set focus to the window. I'll press the tab key. Okay, I'm in the YouTube player, which is not where I want to be. I want to be on my close button. So I'll go back with shift tab. I'm not seeing the focus. I mean, it definitely went somewhere. It might be on the button, but I'm not seeing it. So let's see what's going on. Uh, back in our DevTools, if we right, right click on our HTML element, we can use force state, and we can set that to whichever state we want it to have. In this case, that would be focus. So we can go for state focus, and this should show us all of the styling applied to the element when it receives focus. Um, I'm not seeing a change in the browser, which is not very helpful, uh, but maybe we can find out some, something more in the uh, style tab. 
So if we go in there, we do in indeed see that some styling is being applied on focus. Unfortunately, though, it's the outline property and it's being set to none, which is even made important. I, I don't know why. Uh, but this is essentially the same as hiding the cursor for mouse users. Like it's not, it's not helpful. It's the, it's the opposite of that. We should always be able to see where our focus is. So let's disable that and try our demo again. Back on the website, I press tab. Okay, I'm in the YouTube player again, but let's do shift tab. And hey, I can now see that there is a focus outline around my button. So focus is definitely on it. Now let's see if we can finally close this dialogue and like see what this landing page looks like. So press return and nothing is happening. That's unfortunate. Uh, space. Okay, nothing happening there either. Okay. Uh, well, Dev Tools to the rescue one more time. Uh, if we uh, go to the Chevron menu, like next to the tabs, we can find event listeners. So we can see which event listeners are attached to the currently selected element, which is our button. And we see that there's only a click uh, event listener. So it's not even listening for my keyboard. So this will never work, even though I added all of the information that I did. Um, so that's not, that's not great. Um, the, the conclusion so far is that uh, even with all of the semantic information we added, this doesn't work for everyone. And as Billy prompted, when UX doesn't consider all users, shouldn't it be known as some user experience or sucks? Uh, to find out if these websites work for all users or only some, we'll have to look beyond the pixels. Jenny, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, so let's do exactly that. Instead of looking at pixels, how about we listen to pixels? And we can use voiceover for that. So as a disclaimer, I should mention that I'm a fully sighted user and I use voiceover for accessibility testing, but not in my daily life. So the way I will use this tool is different from how a daily user will use it. So now let's go through the keys that I'll be using. So to open, uh, to start voiceover, you have to call the com hold the command key and press either F5 or the touch ID button three times. Uh, so the voiceover tool is only available on Apple products, hence why the command button uh, without a Windows equivalent. So the next, keys that we'll be using are the control option keys, which are also sometimes known as voiceover keys or VO keys, and the right left arrow to move to the next and previous element. I'll also be using VOU to open the web, web rotor, and web rotor is a voiceover thing essentially. So we can see it here in uh, the, on the left hand side, the dark gray box that says link. A web rotor is essentially a selection of um, navigation menus that we can use. Then below it, uh, a smaller gray box is the speech output box, which is essentially subtitles for voiceover. And then to the right, uh, where you see the Space Jam logo and well, the navigational uh, menu around it. The rectangle that is around the rectangle frame that is around press, press box shuttle it's not actually focus it's the virtual cursor it looks a lot of like focus but it's a bit different and it works differently so it, you can also use it to focus on elements that are not focusable so those are the tools and the keys that i'll be using and let's start the demo so first, I will look at um, Stellar Souvenirs um, on the old website. Honestly, the pick of the page is nostalgia. I was a kid in the 90s. I loved it. And I'll allow Zoe to switch on voiceover. Voiceover on Safari, Stellar Souvenirs window, Stellar Souvenirs web content has keyboard focus. Space. Yes, thank you, voiceover. Back to Jenny. <laughs> So 
before I actually start pressing things, um, yeah, so the Stellar Souvenirs page is very similar to uh, Behind the Jam. We have the same layout with the logo in the top left corner. In the middle is an image with Stellar Souvenirs written um, above it. And in the image, we have seven, what I'm going to assume is links. We know we can tap into them and uh, go to other pages uh, using keyboard. So let's see if we can do the same thing using voiceover. So I'm going to press voiceover keys and U. Window spots menu. Uh, Navigation map image map. It's on my other screen. Closing window navigation map image. Which I can't move, I don't think. Window spots there menu. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, so, right, let's do, so we, we have the uh, web router open. Let's just make sure we're in the right place. Content group, Stellar souvenirs, web content. Window spots menu. Okay, let's see what are the menus available to us. Links menu, images menu. Window spots menu, links menu. Okay, so out of all of the menus available, the links one looks to be the most interesting and straight away, it actually shows a lot more links that I could see. Um, so there were seven links on the image, uh, then this there's the space jam, so back to the main page link, but there are a lot more links here, especially, so the loans and the haircut, I'm not sure where that's going from coming from. So potentially we found two Easter eggs. Uh, let's just go to haircut and see where is it even finding this link. Visit link, link, haircut HTML. Link, haircut HTML. Okay, so we can see the virtual courser focusing on the um red and white squiggly thing and near the barber shop. Uh, honestly, as a sighted user, it would not even come to my mind to click on this thing. Uh, so arguably the voiceover experience is more interesting. Uh, well, there's more things to discover with it. So I'm going to press enter uh, to see where it will take us. Yes, you need one indeed. Stellar souvenirs, web content. Okay, we're taking to a very sassy page. As a reminder, this website was created with very little studio oversight. Um, I mean, well, yeah, uh, I arguably this is a, a more interesting experience with voiceover than without it. So let's see how the new website compares. So I will go to- Space Jam, a new legacy vertical line official site, web content. Okay, so we're we're on the Space Jam website. As a spoiler, I should probably note that you cannot close the popover with the with voiceover. So let's just pretend that a sighted friend, uh, not sighted, a friend with a mouse came over and uh, closed the uh, popover for us. We are on the landing page. Um, so let's just do the first demo again because we still haven't done it for this website. Um, let's um, start, we can start from the landing page, navigate anywhere else and see what happens. And honestly, by this stage, I'm so frustrated with this website that I just want some fun and games. So it's four steps away, let's navigate there. Um, so I'm going to make sure that the focus is on the web page first, so I'll open the rotor. Links menu, images menu, window spots menu, content, group, space jam, a new legacy vertical line official site, web content. Great. Link, home, list seven items, home. Okay, and straight up, we kind of do have a problem. So uh, if you've got it, it's at home, um, seven items, when the navigation bar has nine links. Um, so this is the reverse of the old website. 
it's not even showing what is on the page. It's showing less than there actually is. But again, it's a website that has a button that doesn't work. So everything else feels like nitpicking. Um, here is just moving four spaces and we're on fun and games. Link, video, video link, synopsis, link, fun and games, fun and games. Yes, so we changed uh, pages to fun and games. And of course, there is another problem. Uh, VoiceOver did not announce the change. So um, I can see that the page was changed. But if I was relying on VoiceOver to announce that I'm on a different page, I'd be waiting for a really long time. I mean, essentially, this, this website, it feels like death by a thousand paper cuts. Uh, to fix this specific issue, um, we'd need to use attribute area current and with the value of page. But honestly, on this exasperated note, I'll just pass over to Zoe so that she can play some games and maybe make it a bit better. Thank you. Um, let's uh, turn off voiceover first. Voiceover off. OK, so maybe we can't have fun and games uh, with voiceover and Safari, but maybe we can have some fun and games with uh, JAWS and well, Chrome. So here we are on the old website, and we're on a page titled Match the Monsters. It's a game where they ask us to match the nerd locks, which are the, like the tiny monsters from the game, uh, with the monsters, which are like the things that they turn into that play basketball against Bugs Bunny. Um, so in order for this to work, uh, we would need to have like a description of what these characters look like. So we can like maybe compare characteristics or something like that. Um, so let's first unmute uh, Jaws. Yes. Cool speech. Yes. Um, Similar to voiceover, JAWS has uh, a feature where you can sort of list things on the page. So for example, uh, if I had wanted to get all the graphics on the page, I could do control insert G. Select a graphic dialogue, list one, list view, meet the characters, 15 of 24. To move to items, use the arrow keys. So JAWS has opened uh, a list and it announces how many things are in the list and where your uh, focus currently is and what you should do to sort of navigate. So in this menu, we can see meet the characters, which is the title for this page, which also happens to be an image. Um, we see a few other uh, navigation Coloring books. Meet dash ball tips, 17 of 24. Match the mod stars, 18 of 24. Uh, but we also see the nerd log that they asked us to compare. Nerd lock, 19 of 24. Unfortunately, the description for this image is only nerd lock, which there's five of them, and they're all called nerd lock, but, uh, but, and they all look different. But uh, that difference isn't communicated to us through this alt text. Um, for the monsters, we have five names, which are no, 20 of 24. I'm not going to go through all of them, but it's null, zilch, void, nada, and bupkis, um, all different words for, for the word nothing. Um, again, there's not much of a description here other than their name, uh, so there's not much to go by. I could go on the internet and sort of figure out what they look like, but given that the description for the nerd lock, nerd lock is only nerd lock, like that's not going to help me much. Um, at that point, it would be more of a guessing game, which could still be fun, but it's not how they intended it. So let's close this menu. Escape. And let's uh, mute JAWS for a second. Space, speech on demand. Because maybe we can't play it with, with JAWS, like based on the, the information that we get from the alt text. But maybe we can still do it with a keyboard. That could still be cool. Uh, maybe even fun. Who knows? We do need some fun at this point. Um, OK, so let's use the tab key. And we'll tap through the page. and. Hmm, let's see. Uh, so this nerd lock is he's hung over a bit and he's look, looking kind of angry. I'm gonna guess that it's zilch, which is the big orange one. So I'll press return. And ooh, I was right. 
Um, so I get a, I get presented with a page that says I'm right. Uh, it shows a transformation from the nerd log to the monster, and it also helpfully gives me a link for next, so I can go on to the next one. So now we're on the next page, which shows us another nerd log, which looks kind of sad and I don't know, a bit thin, I guess. Um, so we have the same five monsters at the bottom, and we can navigate to those with the tab key. I am going to guess it's Nada, which is the big red one. So I'll press return on that. Oh, I practiced so much for this talk, and still I get it wrong. Anyway, uh, so I'm, I'm presented with a, with a page that says I'm wrong. Uh, there is a try again button or link, so I could like try again and continue playing. Um, I mean, I had fun trying to play that, and I was able to with a keyboard, which is pretty amazing. Right, so let's see how the new website compares. So we'll, uh, we're now on the new website, and we're already on the fun and games page. Uh, I'm going to turn on JAWS again. Cool speech. And um, we want to sort of explore what's on this page before we dig into it. Um, fortunately, a lot of assistive technologies come with helpful key shortcuts that you can use to like, easily navigate to sections on the, on the website. So for example, in JAWS, you can press the Q key to go to the main landmark. There is no main region on this page. If developers implement one, of course. Um, fortunately, there's also other things that we can do. So we can press the H key to go to headings. Fun and games heading level two. Okay, so this page does have a heading. It's styled as one, so it's good to know that it is a heading. At the same time, it's a heading level two, whereas it's clearly the title for this page, so it should have been a heading level one but something with buttons that don't work. So we'll, we'll give, them, give them a pause. Um, we can use the tab key to sort of uh, go through the focus of all C's, we'll see what is on here. Movie game pinball link graphic. Okay, so there's a pinball game. Movie game R lens link graphic. An AR lens. Movie game activity book link graphic. An activity book. Okay, uh, I think we'll go for pinball. Movie game pinball link graphic. Not entirely sure how that would work for uh, for a screen reader, but maybe we can still play with a keyboard um, and sort of explore. Who knows? So let's activate that. Enter. Space Jam Gold Court Pinball Dash in theaters July 16th and on HBO MAX trademark. Blank page has no links. Space Jam. Okay, I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, so we're presented with a new page, and JAWS helpfully announces the name of the new page, which in this case is also very helpful, or quite helpful. It tells me that we're on the Space Jam Full Core Pinball um, page, which is describing what it does. Uh, I don't much care about the interiors and HBO part, but we'll, we'll leave that for the marketing people, I guess. Um, okay, we'll try to use the same tricks as we did on the previous page on this one. So we'll press the Q key to go to the main landmark. There is no main region on this page. Which, uh, which isn't available. Uh, maybe there are headings. There are no headings on this page. OK, no headings either. Um, well, I can see on this page, it's basically a graphic for the game. And then there's a giant button that says play. So maybe we can get to the button. Um, in JAWS, you can press B to go to the next button. There are no buttons on this page. OK, so. <laughs> Well, it looks like a button. Again, it's not an actual button. Um, maybe they use something else though, and maybe I can get to it with a tab key. Privacy policy link. Okay. Let's, let's mute that. Okay, so pressing tab for some reason activated some music. Not entirely sure what's going on. Um, it also announced the privacy policy link, which is in the footer, like, behind, like after all of the other content on the page. So. That sort of makes me think that I can't play this game with a keyboard. Like, I can't get to it. Uh, I can read the privacy policy. I don't know how much fun that will be, but uh, let's uh, oh, um, it's it's not looking good on on the on that front. Um, so this is the part where I get frustrated, and I guess we should just go to uh, back to our slides. So let's mute Jaws again. Space speech on demand, and go back to our slides. Oop. That's one too far. Okay, so we've done the demo, and I think it's time we get back to those questions. Here we have Bugs Bunny asking the nerd logs, eh, what's up, Doc? Um, okay, so our questions were, does corporations promising to be accessible translate into accessible websites? 
Eh, no, it does not. Uh, not based on these two anyway. Um, if accessibility isn't made a requirement, the end product won't be accessible, uh, regardless of how much corporations pledge to do. Here's Michael Jordan saying, you guys had the special stuff inside you all, of, all along. So if corporations don't care more, then we should. At no point did the original team ask the suits if they could make this fancy website accessible. Accessibility isn't a feature. It's not something extra. It's a core component of the web and has been since its invention. Um, this is basically what uh, Tim said in the, in the uh, keynote too. If you're not sure uh, what you made is accessible, you can use the tools that we showed you in this talk to sort of like get a first, a first step at um, checking whether it is accessible. A good place to start is tabbing through it with a keyboard. Um, make sure that you can get to all of the controls that you would need to be able to control and make sure that you can always see where your focus is. The second question we asked was, have two decades worth of experience and tooling made the web more accessible? Well, yes and no. For users, new tools such as VoiceOver and JAWS definitely help the make, to make the web more accessible. For developers, the amount of new tools we need to learn does sometimes make us jacks of all trades and masters of none. This is a hard line to walk for developers. We do need to learn more tools. However, there are basic tools like HTML that we should make time to master. Because as we have seen, a website created in HTML and inline styling is still accessible 25 years on. So the takeaway really is use tools in an appropriate way. With HTML, that can be using landmarks such as the main element to divide your page or headings to subdivide your document. With general, with general development, it could be getting to know the accessibility tab in DevTools and using it to check an element semantics. And third and last, is the new Space Jam movie better than the old one? Uh, no, no, it's not. Uh, and neither is the website. But maybe we can improve the website a tiny bit. Uh, remember that fake button that we looked at earlier? Let's see if we can actually fix it. So we'll do one last demo. So here we are on in Chrome again, and we have the same uh, like overlay with the YouTube video in it. Um, we'll inspect our button that we worked on earlier again, and let's see. So we added a role of button. We added an ARIA label with like a name for the for the thing, and we added a tab index of zero, uh, which all helps to make this expose as a button but it didn't work. Like we still weren't able to actually close uh, the dialogue. So maybe there's something else that we can do. Um, so the original developers use a div to create a button, which I found questionable, but to each their own. Um, but maybe we can uh, use something else to, to create a button in HTML. I don't know, maybe there's a, um, a button element. Let's try that. So, We'll change the div into a button, and maybe now we can actually close, like, maybe now we can close this dialogue. Um, so I said focus to it. I see the focus outline because I removed the styling, and now I'll press return. And whoo, it works. I'm so happy. So huh, by, by, turning a, by turning a div into a button, we made the web a bit more accessible. Who would have known? Uh, and with that, I just want to say that's all, folks. Fantastic. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Jenny. Let's get into some questions. Uh, just a reminder to our participants, please use that Q&A tab next to the chat on your video screen, um, and we'll hopefully get to them in the next couple of minutes here. Uh, so first question from I believe their name is Nick. What actually are best practices for keyboard navigation in circular navigation menus like we have seen in the original Space Jam website? Jenny, do you want to take that or should I answer? Uh, you answer and if, uh, if I can add something, I will. Um, there's, there's a few different ways you, in which you could do it. Um, 
I don't think there's necessarily a best practice. I think as long as the tab order makes sort of sense, then you're in a good place. Like, I think it's more important that you can get to things and that you can also see where your focus is. Um, it's important not to overthink focus order as long as, it, as it's mostly in the way that you expect it. I think you're in a good place. Great, thank you for that. Next question, and you may have already addressed this, Zoe. Are there ways to temporarily fix such JavaScript issues as you fix in the HTML markup in the demo? Um, I'm not sure. Is that an answer? Um, if, if you if you hit Jenny and myself up on Twitter, then we can sort of elaborate, or maybe you can elaborate on the question and we can answer it there. Um, I'm I'm not sure if you can like inject JavaScript to to fix it. Um, the I'm pretty sure that's hacking at that stage. Yeah, I I, I guess the for for this one the the fix was uh, changing the diff to a button, and the reason that then works is not because we like we didn't change any JavaScript. The thing that because it works is because if you press return on a button, it will also trigger click, uh, which will then trigger like the JavaScript assigned to the click listener. So that's why it worked. Awesome. Thanks for that explanation. Next question we have from Paul. Do you think that adhering to accessibility guidelines limits in any way the creativity of user interactions on websites? Mm. Jenny, any thoughts? Uh, I, I yeah I have strong opinions there. Uh, I I one of the most creative websites I know is also one of the most unusable ones because it was created to be unusable. I think it's called something along the lines of unusableux.com or something similar, where it has a button that you will never be able to click because it runs away from the arrow. Um, so websites, they're meant to be usable, not if, if they're unusable, it's a cool art project, but it's not necessarily a great website. And if anything, um, looking at the difference between the old Space Jam, which is I'm still, maybe it's nostalgia speaking, maybe it's design, 90s design coming back into fashion, but it's a great app website. It, it's creative, it's funny. Uh, it's interesting. It's it's a pleasure to just go and navigate, and then you have the new website that, that is incredibly formulaic, uh, built to a template, but it's not accessible. The old one is so. I think it's it's limiting to think that accessibility guidelines limit ex limit creativity. I, I would second that. Um... And I'd like to add that there's always space for new ways of interaction. For example, there's a lot of work happening uh, to make VR accessible, uh, which is very exciting and is completely new because how do you do that? Um, so I think for, for websites, for the most part, as Jenny put it, like the way that we do things is for a reason. And those patterns are pretty solid and people know how to interact with them. Because if you feel the need to create a new interaction pattern, then you should also think about all of the people using that interaction pattern and how would they interact with it. And that's the hard part. Great points there. And it looks like we have a follow up to that question. On the flip side, can you talk about how you've seen accessibility actually drive innovation? Um, so do you want to take it? Uh, I could, but also interested in your thoughts. I think um, I, it is a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting down and thinking about it because the only examples I can think of there, I guess they're more like stuff that is from the past rather than stuff happening now. Uh, so I think with accessibility and how we like this is how different UI patterns developed 
that you just don't think about now anymore where um that the nav bar is at the top of the page and uh it falls into a burger menu so it's i i'm but at the same time, I cannot say that it was accessibility, that it's more the UI patterns became. Oh, I do have an example. Um, the um, uh, the um, iPhones, um, the massive ones. So to hold them with one hand, even if you have large hands, is ridiculous. Like they're, they're massive. They're the size of an uh, iPad. Um, so if you want to close um, a tab, you have to reach with your thumb to the other side of the screen which no one has thumbs that size so usually people start typing with two hands and using both hands um so the new um apple ios the um the url and a lot of the functions that are usually at the top of the web page they're at the bottom for that reason and to a degree that can be seen as design led by accessibility. I would also like to add that a lot of things that would be considered assistive technology or that are accessible technology, but might not necessarily be considered as such. Take your, uh, take your keyboard, for example, which is in essence a way to access the stuff on your computer. It's assistive technology in a way. Or um, uh, another one would be voiceover itself where you can also use it to read entire pages. I know a lot of people with ADD or ADHD use that to read pages, like have the computer read it to them. Um, another one where it drives innovation. Um, well, in the 18, yeah, 1800s, we had uh, speech synthesizers, like that was when they were first invent, invented, like that's considered part of um, where I would consider that part of accessibility history. Um, another one would be things like ebooks, uh, very helpful. Um, I, I, I strongly believe that that was there was a lot of accessibility talk that went into that. Um, I remember reviewing the specification for it. anyway. Uh, the other places where it drives innovation is, I think, for us at CrowdStrike every single day. Uh, we have intense discussions about accessibility. How do we how do we solve for things? For us, the question is never do we make it accessible, but more how how do we make it accessible? How does that work? Um, so for us, it's something that drives innovation every day. I would say, um, and I would love to see that everywhere. Absolutely. Well, I think that is a great note to end on. We are at um, fifty minutes past the hour here. Uh, Zoe and Jenny, thank you so much for your fun presentation. I know I really enjoyed it. Um, and I hope everybody has a great rest of their AxCon. Yeah, likewise. And thank you for having us. Enjoy thank you for having us. Thank you.